for a while. Uh, this is not any new information to any of us, so we need to tackle that issue immediately. If uh, uh, you know, that would be my suggestion. We'll reach out to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. LeTurner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Secretary, welcome today. Thank you. We have seen a surge in recent years <clears throat> of youth mental health issues. And we are seeing in particular that children's use of social media is impacting their mental health. Many companies are more interested in making money off kids than protecting them, sadly. The data is alarming. For example, the rate of eating disorders has doubled amongst adolescent girls and children's hospitals are seeing a surge of children showing up with serious mental health issues, including a 67% increase in referrals at Children's Mercy in my own state. The NIH has begun working on a study to better understand the impacts of social media on mental health. Are there any current findings that you can share with us today? Uh, I'd like to tell you that we've had some definitive research done and we can give you findings, but I'm not aware of it. I can make sure we check with NIH, and if you'd like us to follow up with you, we can. But we are abs I think there's not more just the NIH, but a number of agencies, a number of private sector and academic research institutions are trying to look into this as well. Well, that's what I want to talk about. What is HHS doing to prevent research and intervene early when a child is struggling with their mental health, especially in the case of serious mental illness like eating disorders? Uh, I can give you, I can try to make sure we respond back with the, the different projects that are underway, research projects underway at NIH, and we can certainly make sure that our, our agency, our SAMHSA agency, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration also follows up with you because they're the ones that are doing the more direct services to communities today. And so, for example, when you all passed a bipartisan bill on, uh, domestic, on gun violence and provided monies for mental health services, uh, SAMHSA was the agency that was charged with trying to dispense those dollars best. I would love some of those, uh, we'll those answers. With. That would be helpful. The crisis of antimicrobial resistance, yes. or AMR, threatens modern me medicine and is currently a leading cause of death worldwide. I'm encouraged that the administration recognizes AMR is a serious and urgent threat to patients and public health by including a proposal that aligns with the bipartisan, bicameral uh, Pasteur Act, which I'm proud to co-lead in the House, to encourage the development of innovative antimicrobial drugs and ensure we are armed with an adequate supply of properly stewarded antimicrobial products against highly dangerous drug-resistant microbes. Can you describe your budget proposal on antimicrobial uh, subscriptions in more detail, including uh, an expected timeline for implementation? Yeah. Uh, first, Congressman, I, I, we don't know each other well, but I'd love to give you a hug because there just aren't enough members of Congress who, who want to touch this issue of antimicrobial resistance. And in so many ways, as you know, people are dying at rates that sometimes surpass COVID. And we have an obligation to make sure people are safe and we don't lose quality medicines because they're not used properly or they're overused. Uh, and we don't prepare for the next bacteria that may come at us really hard. And so what we're trying to do is very, very similar to what you're proposing in the Pasteur Act is figure out a way to make it worthwhile for manufacturers of these medicines to stay in the game because many of these medicines, as you know, don't have a lot of profit behind them. And so it's tough for a business to stay afloat trying to sell drugs that don't, you can't sell for very much money and often aren't needed until there's a crisis. And so the subscription model, which says everyone will buy in and start to try to do the manufacturing, give us a, an industry that can be available they can do that because we'll have a subscription model where everyone pays in early so there's money to be had so you don't have to wait till there's a crisis to know that you get paid for your good work in manufacturing a particular medicine. I appreciate that. Of the over 100 million Medicaid enrollees, approximately 40 million are able-bodied adults. Over the past several years, your administration has revoked multiple waivers, allowing states to test work requirements for these able-bodied adults on Medicaid. At the same time, we've seen data from state Medicaid agencies indicating that many of these same able-bodied adults are not working at all. We've had work requirements as a core principle for participants in the TANF program for decades now. What is your opposition to allowing states to experiment with policies to move these adults from welfare to work? And so, Congressman, let me make sure I'm clear, because you mentioned both TANF, uh, well, the welfare program, and Medicaid. 
which is a healthcare program. So tell me where you want me to focus. Well, fo I focus specifically on the uh, on your revoking multiple waivers, allowing the states uh, to test work requirements. So this is in regards to Medicaid, which offers waivers to the states. The 1115 waivers. 1115 waivers are part of the Medicaid program within C the CMS agency. Uh, the waivers are provided to states, and just to make sure it's clear, Medicaid has certain laws that Congress has passed on how we implement Medicaid and how we get resources to states to implement the program that's principally for lower income Americans to have access to doctors and hospitals. Medicaid, it's a matching program. Where if I'm running out of time. Oh, get, I'm sorry. Get, get okay. to the core of my question, okay. which, is, which, which is my observation that there seems to be an opposition to allowing states to uh, test things like work requirements. Sure. Uh, the Medicaid program's focus is on health care, making sure health care is improved. If you look throughout the Medicaid statutes, you won't find a single word that says work requirements. And what we do is we make sure that any proposal by a state, whether it's direct uh, Medicaid uh, servicing or through a waiver of those servicing requirements, that the health of that individual who will be impact impacted by the waiver improves. And so that's what we look at. We don't look at any other thing. A state may want to try to do other things, which is fine. But our purpose is to make sure if you're going to ask for a Medicaid dollar, that it, when it is applied to that individual in your state, it improves the health of that individual. And so that's what we look at. And if certain waivers are retracted, it's because we're not seeing results and taxpayers have a right to demand results when states spend taxpayer dollars. I'll tell you what's good for uh, people's health also is, uh, is understanding the dignity and pride that comes with work and not allowing states to uh, pursue this and to have the opportunity to observe what works in one state and what may not work so that we can have best practices um, is, is not a good thing. And so I hope, I, I hope that mm -hmm. you will uh, rethink your position on this. Just I just want to make sure we're clear. We don't stop any state from... I, my question was very clear. Your well, answer gentle, wasn't so much. time's but, expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate you being with us this afternoon. Congratulations on uh, your 